Hi, my name is Matt Seuss, and on May 11th, 2020, I did a free webinar for the National Photography Enthusiast Group using Luminar 4, and in particular with sky replacement. I showcased a number of different photos replacing the sky using the AI sky replacement tool, as well as the new AI augmented sky tool. Here is a recording of that webinar. There you go. Got Let's it. See if everyone... <clears throat> Perfect. We got it. All right, hey. on, buddy. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Mark. And uh, thanks for everyone attending here tonight. I got a uh, fun little presentation. We're going to be talking about sky replacement using Luminar 4 in particular. And just to give you a real quick background on me, uh, my name is Matt Seuss. I'm an Olympus educator and fine art photographer from Bozeman, Montana, originally from New England. I've been a professional photographer for over 30 years, and I started as a photojournalist. So the first 17 years of my career as a photojournalist up in New England, moved out west in 06 to do fine art photography. And it's kind of interesting, here I am doing a presentation on sky replacement, because that is not something that you want to be doing if you're a photojournalist or a documentary photographer. But... Uh, it's interesting because when I first left photojournalism, I did have a hard time doing a whole lot of edits to my photos. I didn't really do a lot of editing at first because you know, being a photojournalist and a documentary photographer, you can't do a whole lot of edits to your photos. And as I was going into the world of fine art photography, um, you know, I was seeing a lot of people and they were doing edits on their photos. And so I had to really sort of wrap my head around how I could actually do that and you know what's what's what can you do what are the rules you know can you you know take something out of a photo can you put something into a photo can you replace this guy can you remove things and uh, probably about a few years into doing this I was out in Santa Fe New Mexico and I was out photographing the fall foliage of the aspens and it was a little bit early in the season and I was walking around and there was a whole group of plein air painters out there and I was looking at their paintings and you know, right now I said it was early in the fall season, so the aspens were just starting to turn. And there was a little bit of yellow on some of the aspens, but mostly it was green. And I'm looking at all these plain air painters and looking at what they're painting. And they had on their easels, there was just a field of yellow leaved aspens. And I was like, wow, okay, so if a painter can go ahead and do artistic license to an image, why can't a photographer? And so that experience really opened me up to doing a lot more things creatively with my photos. And, you know, to now where, you know, hey, if you want to replace a sky, go right ahead. Why not? So, again, this isn't going to appeal to the documentary photographers out there. But, you know, if you're a, a fine art photographer, if you take your you know, photography as an art form, if you are a real estate agent, I mean, you know, replacing skies is super important. I mean, you know, real estate agents, you know, you're not always a real estate photography. You're not always able to get out there at sunrise and at sunset when the lighting is perfect. I mean, you got to be out there photographing a whole bunch of houses and you just can't wait for the perfect conditions. And if you're a travel photographer, you're going to a location that, you know, you booked your trip maybe a year in advance. You have a one week window to go out and get the best photos that you uh, want to get. And the weather is not cooperating and you're not getting great skies and you're stuck with, you know, boring blue skies. So there's a lot of creative instances where sky replacement works really well. And it's it's interesting because I, I see the forums online and, you know, there are some people that are just dead set against it. Um, I, I got a feeling that a lot of people here watching this tonight are, are kind of open minded to it. And if not already doing your own sky replacements, otherwise, why would you be in a webinar with sky replacement as the main subject? So uh, welcome all of you, and uh, we're going to get started, and I'm going to go through some photos here. And what I've done is I've, I've collected a bunch of photos that, you know, show off uh, some of the strengths that you can do with Luminar 4. Uh, Luminar 4 has really made sky replacement a lot easier than the other programs. I mean, I used to do this with On1. On1 has some really good masking on it, but the AI portion of Luminar really makes us a lot easier to do. Uh, it does have some problems though too. When you're relying on AI, artificial intelligence, there are some instances where the software is not doing exactly what you want it to do. And so you have to make some compromises and make some adjustments to it. And uh, as I'm going through this uh, demonstration, feel free to ask any questions and Mark, feel free to interrupt me at any time uh, to field questions. I don't mind answering questions in the middle of the presentation. That's perfectly fine for me. 
So let's go ahead and I'm gonna load up one photo here. And on a lot of these photos that I'm gonna do, I'm gonna show you, I'm, we're gonna start from the end and we're gonna work backwards. I call this deconstructing the photo. So I've already done the sky replacement on this image and uh, we're gonna work backwards and see how that was done. Now let's go into my edit panel inside of Luminar 4 and let's take a look at the before and after. So here it is, this is a typical shot for a real estate photographer you know, just not being out at the, uh, not having the opportunity to be out at the right time to get clouds. And so you want to sell the property. So you need to do some sky replacement and get a nice sky in there. So that's what I did with this photo. And if we take a look here, we're going to go backwards in time. Uh, I have a stamp layer here. I'm going to talk about what that is in a moment, but I'm going to turn that off and get to my base layer. And we can see here, Luminar is really cool because it will show you where you've done edits in. And we can see here, I didn't do anything in the pro or in the portrait or in the creative because those are a little bit darker gray. But I did do some adjustments in the essentials tab uh, because then we can notice that because that is a wider uh, icon. So I'm gonna click on there and then we can see here, I did some adjustments in the light, in the AI enhance and in the color. Now I normally work from a, a top down workflow. So I'll start from the top and with this particular image, I, I left my white balance as shot. There's no issues with the color. And I made some adjustments to the shadows, opened up the shadows a little bit. And before I do any sky replacement, I wanna get the photo looking pretty decent to begin with. So that's tip number one, you're gonna be doing any sky replacement, get the photo looking pretty decent to begin with, because that's gonna really play an important part in getting a really nice sky foreground combination. Now, the next panel I went into was the AI Enhance. And I was generous on this. I used a little bit of AI Accent. If I turn that panel off and on, we can see what that did. And this AI Accent slider is really cool inside of Luminar 4. Uh, whenever I'm in the program, I'm almost always using this to various degrees of intensity. And what this did for me here in particular was it opened up my shadows, gave me a little bit better contrast and some color saturation as well. When I'm doing these edits, I'm really paying attention to my foreground, not so much the sky. The sky is going to be replaced. But I am paying attention to the amount of halos that I get. AI Accent is really good, but it can also give you some halos. And so I had this at uh, 66. If I just max this out to 100, I might start seeing a little bit of color haloing going around some of the larger objects. That can sometimes play a little bit of an effect, negative effect on your sky replacement. So with this particular image, I had this down to 66. I was getting decent results. It might not be my final adjustments that I wanna make on my foreground, but I at least got it looking pretty decent to start doing the sky replacement without having a whole lot of halos going on. And let's go into the color. I just gave it a little bit of a boost of saturation and vibrance. Now, if you remember when I was working backwards here, I mentioned a stamp layer. And I've been doing this a lot lately. The stamped layer, if you're, if you're not familiar with layers, when you create a stamped layer, it makes a whole brand new layer in your photo, and it's a combination of all the adjustments that you made prior to. And then it, it resets all of your sliders to zero on that new stamped layer with all those adjustments baked in. And that is important because if you're doing a sky replacement and it's on your same layer, the in particular, the AI Enhance can be notorious for really it'll adjust your sky too as well. And I don't want to adjust my sky based off the adjustments that I made on my foreground. So if you make a new stamped layer, all your sliders are reset to zero, but the photo will look just like it looks right now with all those adjustments baked in. And then when I put the sky in, it's not going to have any of these old slider adjustments applied to the sky. So that's where I will usually start now with a new stamped layer. And so if I turn this stamped layer on, Let's activate that and let's go in here. We can see that I did do some adjustments here to the creative, which was the sky replacement. Let's turn that off for a second. And then also the AI enhance. I use some AI sky enhancer. Now, when I make that new stop, um, when I make that new stamped layer, the first thing I do is go into, we'll remember that I did the AI enhance, but the first thing I do is I go obviously into the AI sky replacement and Let's turn that off for a second here. Okay, so this is the image, again, with that new stamp layer, all those adjustments baked in. 
I'm gonna turn this on. I'm also gonna open up the advanced settings here. And I'm gonna talk about this panel here, what all these uh, adjustments do. Up on top here, it's letting me know which sky I've already used. If you didn't have a sky replaced in here yet, um, I forget exactly what it says. We'll look at it in another photo, but it does say something about um, you know load your sky image or choose sky or something like that up on top there. And when you click on that drop down, you have a whole bunch of options here. Now these here, blue sky and dramatic sky and dramatic sunset, these are all built into the program and these are what Luminar supplies you with. And it's, it's a good collection to sort of get you started using the program, but I think you're gonna get tired of those skies really quickly. They're not very high resolution to begin with. Um, there's a way you can find out in the program, you know, how big or small those are. I've, I've looked behind the scenes in there and they're really a low resolution image and they keep it a low resolution image because of the speed of the software. If you had this all loading with high resolution images, it's gonna slow down the computer tremendously. And you may have seen some hacks out there online. I'm not gonna tell you how to do it, but there are some hacks out there where you can actually put your own skies in. It's not recommended because of the performance hit that you'll have on the computer. And also too, when Luminar or when Skyloom updates Luminar, you end up wipe, it wipes out your skies. So it's in a certain folder baked into the um, program. And when they update it, they just replenish it again with their own skies. So if you didn't have a backup copy of your own skies and you put it into that little hack folder there, you're gonna lose your skies. So try to avoid putting your skies in here. It's really nice because it does make it convenient to access your skies. Um, we'll see Luminar doesn't have the best implementation yet of going through a lot of skies to pick it outside of using this, but it is it is what it is right now. So you'd wanna go down here to load custom, custom sky image. And when you do that, it'll then open up your finder window and you can go ahead and navigate and look for a sky. Now, right now I'm on a Mac, so this is a finder window. On a, on a uh, PC, it'll, be, it'll open up Windows Explorer. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky because it's, again, it's not the best implementation of this software. So you have to scroll through here and look at all these tiny little thumbnails to figure out which photo you wanna use with it. Now there's a couple things that you can do instead. You can go over into your finder and go through there and in your finder or Windows Explorer, you can increase or decrease the size of your thumbnails. You can't do that when you're in the Luminar finder window, unfortunately. The other thing you can do is, or, or let me back up here, when you're still in your finder window, what you do is you look for the sky that you want, remember which folder it is, remember which number it is, then go back to Luminar and then navigate to that sky that you wanted to use. We're back in Luminar right now and I'm in that uh, finder window that opens up, again, just from clicking on here and clicking on load sky image small thumbnails, you can go ahead and click on it once and then hit the space bar and it will open up in a larger view. Now, I haven't fired up my Windows computer in a long time. I'm pretty sure that this little trick works the same in Windows. Uh, let me know if it doesn't, I'd be interested to know. But on a Mac, you can just go ahead through here and be like, okay, let's take a look at this cloud. Let's see what this cloud looks like. Click on the space bar. If you like it, or if you don't, just click on the little X in the upper left-hand corner. If you like it, you can click on open. If you don't like it, just keep on going through and selecting a perfect sky. Now, this is a good opportunity right now to talk about what is a perfect sky. What you have to do when you're selecting your skies is first pay attention. Let me turn this off here. You have to pay attention to the light in your foreground, and you're gonna have to find a sky that closely matches the light to what's happening on the foreground. Now, if we're looking at this image right here, I can tell that the sunlight is kind of like behind me, a little bit uh, camera left um, to me. I, I could see some shadows on the, on the house over here. I can see the shadow right over here. So this shadow from a tree, this shadow over here from just the, uh, the roof line. So my sky, my sunlight in the sky is uh, up into my, uh, over my left hand shoulder a little bit behind me. So I'm not gonna wanna get a, a sky that has a sun in the background there that's visible. The shadows aren't gonna match. And that's the you know number one thing that people will see right off the bat and be like, okay, you replaced the sky and you didn't do a good job. 
I can see that the light just totally doesn't match. So you have to keep that in mind when you are choosing your sky. And in here, I ended up choosing for this particular image, uh, see here, that was number 192. And I am using skies. I have a, a collection of three different kits of skies uh, that total, in total, over 700 clouds and skies that I've been collecting over the years. And uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit uh, further along in this presentation. Mark has a link for you to get a little bit of a discount on those skies too. So these are the skies I'm gonna be using, and I ended up using sky number 192. We'll take a look at the full version of that. So I clicked on open. I'm gonna click on cancel right now because I've already applied the sky. And then now once you've chosen your sky, you are presented with a whole bunch of options here. I'm just gonna reset this, and so we'll start from zero. Let's go back here. Okay, so it says sky selection. So you click on that drop down. Let's click on load sky image and that was number 192. Let's go ahead and click on that and click on open. Okay, so all my sliders have been reset to its default and we'll go through these real quick. The horizontal blending, uh, we're not really gonna see that in this image, but if I had an image that had a, um, let's say I photographed um, on a beach and you know you can see the ocean going off into the horizon the hor horizon blending is going to help smooth the sky relative to your horizon we don't see a clear horizon in this right now so that slider really isn't doing any effect on this particular image horizon position you can bring this up so and if i'm going to bring this all the way oh, that's i'm bringing it down let me bring this all the way out of the picture here this is going to bring your sky, move it up or down. You don't have the option of moving your sky left or right. So this is another thing that they are gonna have to kind of work on in future impl implementations of this program. You are limited. You can flip it left and right, and that's what this button down here, flip sky left and right, but you're not able to really reposition it like you would if you were using a transform tool. So that's something you also have to keep in consideration when you are working on your skies. So let's go ahead here and I can see right off the bat here that it's not doing a good job right down in here. And we'll get to the, some of those controls in just a second. Uh, relight scene, this is gonna relight your foreground and try and match it with your sky. There, there is a little bug in, actually it's not even a bug, it's what they designed it for, for some reason. I've I've talked to uh, Skyloom a bunch of times on trying to get this uh, fixed, and they were supposed to have had it fixed in this current version of Luminar, but they, they actually haven't. If you relight the scene all the way to zero, it's still relighting your foreground a little bit, and you may find that you're having a little bit of a blue cast to your foreground. So that is something that I'm still on them about, um, but just pay attention to that relight scene. When you do go to zero, it isn't a full zero, but this relight scene, I don't use it a whole lot, um, but it is good to, uh, depending on the clouds and depending on your foreground, definitely play around with that slider to see if you can match the foreground sky, you know, color and even um, lightness and darkness to what the sky is. Now, we have, I mentioned here, we can see that I have an area where it's just not finding the correct sky uh, to replace it. And we have three controls over here, sky global, close gaps, and sky local. And these are the controls to adjust how it's blending in, how Luminar, the AI, is figuring out what your sky is. And I'm gonna, uh, Luminar, or Skyloom has on their website, they have an online guide, and they have descriptions of what these sliders are. And they're pretty good descriptions. I'm going to read them to you and give you my thoughts on those. So the sky global, this affects how the texture is mixed into the scene, the texture being your sky. A higher value will increase the amount of new sky that is added. So in this particular image here, if we increase this, what I like to do to see what a slider is doing is just sort of max it all out and see what's going on. Now see that sky global ended up filling in this gap where Luminar was not seeing that there was a sky there. So if I go back to zero again, we can see here that Skyloom, the AI just didn't think that that was part of the sky. So by adjusting that sky global, now it fixed that area there. The closed gaps, this slider 
right there, this slider fixes small details and holes that were not filled in by the replaced sky initially. You may need to adjust this if the image has fine details such as trees or wires. So we can go in here and zoom in, and it's actually did a good job. I can see clouds behind the, uh, behind the branches, so I don't need to make any adjustments here. But if you did find some gaps in here that Luminar was not finding the sky, then use that closed gap slider. And then we have sky local. This slider is useful to control the overlap of the new sky with the original clouds. This slider is designed to influence how much of the original clouds are replaced. So this program here works best when you have no clouds in your sky. When you have clouds in your sky, the AI starts to get a little bit confused depending on how many clouds you have in there. So use that sky local to try and make adjustments to see if you can get a good blend of your original sky with the new sky that you're, being, that you're uh, replacing it with. Sometimes it works, sometimes you'll have some images that you're, you're just stumping the AI and it's not gonna work on that. So just keep that in mind. Sky defocus, I have an example where this is gonna work out really well. What this does is enables you to blur out the sky. So make your clouds all blurry. Uh, this uh, doesn't really work on this particular image unless you were thinking I was maybe shot it with a tilt shift lens or something. Uh, the sky to focus, I use that if I'm shooting with a telephoto lens or a macro lens and I have a sky in the background that I want to replace. That works out really good to blur the sky. Sometimes I might blur it just a little bit, but on this particular image here, we kind of know that, I mean, I'm shooting it with a wide angle lens. We can see I have tons of depth of field. We can see in the hill in the background there that that that, that is all sharp. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to blur out the background of this that much. And I already showed you flip sky. This flips it left and right. This can be good to change to change the position of your clouds. It's also good too if uh, you know your sun was over here, but you needed it over here. You can then flip it and then change the position of the sun, and then make the image look a lot better because your shadows are in the right spot. Atmospheric haze, this is a uh, something new that came in the most recent update to Luminar 4, and this is a really cool slider that allows you, it, it'll put digital haze into your photo. Uh, real, it works really good if we go back to that um, beach scene that I was talking about, and you can see the horizon way off in the distance, and usually when you're looking at horizon lines way out in the distance, there is, you see a little bit of haze just from the atmosphere uh, where the uh, sky meets the horizon. And so this will add some of that haze in. It also works really good too if your sky is really punchy and like the, right now the sky is a little bit too blue, I think, for this image. So if I go ahead and add some atmospheric haze, let me just show you what it looks like if I max it all out. We can see how much haze it puts in there. But I use I, I like to use this as a um, an adjustment to the color intensity of that sky. So something like that is looking pretty good. And then we have sky temperature, so we can warm or cool our sky and sky exposure. We can darken it or increase it. Now, I don't know if any of you watching this noticed anything, and I just noticed it when I was using the atmospheric haze. I saw a little spill off over here where uh, Luminar thinks that part of the roof is actually part of my sky. A couple ways we can attack that. I can go ahead and maybe if I lower this, uh, yeah, there we go, lower in that sky global, it got rid of it. But look at it also then messed up over here again, which was why I initially used this adjustment. So let's go ahead, one easy way to do that. Let's get this back to where it was seeing my sky over here. Okay, we got clouds on my roof. This is when you have to then use the mask and I can click on edit mask. And then I have a couple different ways to do masks. I'm not gonna go through all of these. I mean, you can do luminosity masks, and you, you can do gradient masks, radial masks. Uh, for me, the most important one that I use is the brush. And so I'll click on brush. You have some options up on top here. You have paint and erase. So if I kept this at paint and I clicked and started dragging around in this image, it's gonna paint in the effect, which is the new clouds. I don't wanna do that. I just wanna erase this little area here. So I'm just gonna click on erase and I'll zoom in a little bit on my image and let's move over here. And then with the erase, I'll just go ahead 
and erase it. And I can also see a little bit of a color shift here. This might be because of that relight scene. Let me lower that relight scene. Yeah, and see that color shift is still set to stay in. So even though I removed the clouds, and I did, there we go. Even though I removed the clouds, there's still a little bit of that color shift. So I'm just gonna go ahead and remove this entire effect from the top of the house. Come up over here and maybe lower my brush a little bit. Uh, if you guys don't know what the shortcuts are to increase or decrease your brush size, remember your left and right bracket keys. That is a super handy shortcut. Your right bracket key will increase your brush size. Your left bracket key will decrease it. All right, now that I've done that, I'll click on done. Let's get back to the full image here. And let me go ahead and just add a little bit more of the atmospheric haze. Uh, this looks pretty decent right now. At this point, what I would then end up doing is going into the Essentials tab and remember how I use the AI Enhance. Let me go ahead and turn that on a little bit or turn it on and I use the AI Sky Enhancer a little bit. Um, actually, this AI, AI Sky Enhancer is making it a little bit too crazy now in this image from that default setting. I've made some adjustments to this photo um, that I didn't do in my initial uh, preparation of this file. So I'm actually gonna back off on that sky enhancer even more to make that a little bit more believable. And this is where you can go ahead and use the AI accent or go ahead and use any of these things. I could go into here, maybe give it a little bit of a uh, structure boost, uh, just to give it a little bit more detail. But once you've replaced that sky, now you're set to go ahead and make other adjustments to it. And when you make other adjustments, let me just show you, I'll just knock down the exposure. It's making it to the foreground, not to our sky. If you want to have everything be applied, all you have to do is just go up ahead, click on create a new stamp layer again. This will then merge the sky with our foreground. And we'll just wait for that to go ahead and do that. And once that does eventually get merging, you'll see the more layers you have, the uh, the slower the program will run. And I'm also doing a webinar here, and this is a full raw file. So uh, I didn't shrink these files down at all. So now that we are on that new stamp layer, now I can go ahead, and if I make an exposure adjustment, it's working at the whole image. Okay, I'm gonna grab a sip of some water here. And while I'm doing that, Mark, uh, you got any questions for me on that first photo? Matt, I do, hold on here. Uh, Bill asks, uh, can you use raw files for your sky replacements or do you need to edit all raw and advance and changes JPEGs? Yeah, hey Bill, um, I'm pretty sure that they um, no, they changed a little bit of this. Initially when it first came out, if I'm remembering correctly, it had to be just JPEGs with the AI, um, with the other one, the AI uh, augmented sky, it's still JPEGs. I think now with this, um, you can use uh, JPEGs or TIFFs, but you can't use raw files. So what you need to do first is process your raw file, and then you'd need to export it uh, from, from Luminar. So you can go file, export, or click on the shortcut and export it. Honestly, I would recommend just exporting it as a, uh, as a uh, JPEG at, in the highest quality. Um, I know some people get a little um, freaked out because my clouds, they're JPEGs and they're not 16-bit TIFFs. And there's a couple of reasons for that. I mean, I have 700 clouds and uh, you know, you're downloading as it is right now in the high quality JPEGs that I'm saving, you're downloading gigabytes, two, three, four gigabytes worth of just JPEGs. If they were TIFF files, 16-bit, I mean, we're talking like, uh, I forgot what it was, like 70 gigabytes in my, um, in my Blue Skies uh, folder. So you don't really, you know, it, once your file is processed and you're not doing crazy, crazy adjustments to it, you're fine with a 8-bit JPEG file. I, I used to work at newspapers. We used to transmit to magazines and still do, you know, to um, JPEG files. As long as you've done the heavy lifting on the raw file initially, your JPEGs are going to be fine. It'll take up a lot less space on your hard drive. Okay, Bill, does that answer your question, sir? He said yes. All right, cool. Okay, cool. Uh, Any others? 
Uh, Tom asks, uh, well, we're, we're getting to this. He says, what's a good source for sky images? Can you recommend a website? Uh, <laughs> I certainly can. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to send you guys, I guess it's a good time to send the link, uh, Matt, that you referred to. Um, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and send this link. There's a link in your chat box. If you click on the link, uh, you know, you can um, uh, that'll bring open it up in your this. browser. I have three different kits, uh, one that has 400 photos, um, one that has, uh, so this one here is my original one that launched in November, has 400 images. These two, the Blue Sky and the Desert Sunsets, just launched uh, about a month or so ago. The Blue Sky includes 200 Blue Sky images uh, perfect for those a lot of those photos we take are just in the middle of the day and uh, these are the clouds for you on that and then i also have a kit with 45 um, images from the arizona sonoran desert uh, nice sunsets that can work on uh, pretty much almost any anywhere it doesn't have to be just photos from arizona you can use this on uh, anything and the, the uh, my two bigger kits the blue sky and the ultimate cloud uh, those also come with free bonus training videos too to uh, help you along with uh, with your sky replacement. Let's take a look at this one here. So this sky was used in my uh, desert uh, sunset sky. And let's take a look. We'll wait for this to load here inside a uh, luminar. And just a minute. Again, I'm using uh, raw files here. So. My foreground is the raw file, obviously with the JPEG for the sky. And let's just take a look at this. I'm gonna turn off that stamp layer and we'll just take a quicker look now at the adjustments that I did here. So now let me get this before and after. This was photographed in Zion National Park and uh, this is actually a perfect scenario on what I'm talking about. This was uh, photographed a couple of years ago. I, was, uh, I teach a lot of photo workshops in uh, Tetons and Zion and elsewhere. And this was during my fall foliage photo workshop and great viewpoint here. We've got the sunrise, you know, the sunlight is just starting to come up. Um, the sunlight hasn't hit any of the peaks yet, but you know, I'm, I'm here with a group of students and they come from all over Canada and all over the place. And, you know, they're only out there for a few days uh, on the workshop. And, you know, what are you going to do when you do not get any clouds? Um, this happens a lot on, you know, it all depends on the weather. You're at the mercy of mother nature. So this was one of those mornings where we had great light on the foreground, but just did not have anything in the sky. Makes a nice photo, not too bad. Uh, we can see here, I did some adjustments with smart contrast and shadows and a little bit of uh, AI accent and even a little bit of sky enhancer. I didn't even have to do that because I'm replacing the sky. And then I went and created that new stamped layer and let me turn off the AI Enhance and go here. And for this, I chose one of my desert, oh, did I turn that layer on? I chose one of my uh, desert sunset photos. There we are. And that's off, okay, cool. And let's see here, that was uh, sunset number 32. Let me see if I can, uh, grab that real quick and show you what that one looked like. So that was number 32. And so here's that image right there. And I thought this was the perfect image for, even though it was a sunset, a perfect image for a sunrise. And by blending that in there, uh, I just moved the horizon position a little bit. Didn't have to, uh, let me see here, the relight scene. That's, it's defaulted at plus 20. I knocked it back a little bit. We can see here, if I bring this relight scene over all the way to the right, we can see how it's trying to warm my foreground to try and match my sky. I thought it was a little aggressive, so I actually backed off from the default setting. And the sky replacement did a good job, so I didn't really have to do any adjustments here. Didn't even add any atmosphere case, but lowered the temperature a little bit and lowered the sky exposure a little bit. And then now, I mean, I've been at Zion a lot of times and I've seen sunrises just like this. And so, you know, again, you're in a location that you, you know, may only have one shot of going there. And, you know, if Mother Nature disappoints you, you know, don't let that ruin your creativity in your future images. Now, this was one interpretation of this photo. Let me go back here into my main catalog. Now, I have the same photo to the right of it. Luminar doesn't allow you to duplicate images or make versions. Um, their browser is still kind of basic. So I had to go into Finder 
on my Mac and duplicate that image in that same folder. And so I have another a copy of it. Now here's another interesting thing too. I have clouds up on top here. I didn't add them. Every once in a while, the catalog in Luminar just gets a little freaky on, on me and it's adding some clouds. See, there's no clouds here, but then it for some reason wants to add it in my preview. And I mean, <laughs> I don't know where it's pulling it from, but it's not from this photo. But let's go in here and let's go ahead and do a couple other versions of this. Let me just bump up the AI accent a little bit. Um, just to, you know, this is such a great, great slider in Luminar. And that's all I'm gonna do is just that AI accent. And let's see here. Let's go ahead and make that new stamp layer. And we'll just wait for that for a second. Okay, now that we have that new stamp layer, let's go ahead and let's see here. Let's go into, come on. Okay, I'm gonna go into, uh, let's see, I think it's in bundle one. So this is in my original, the ultimate one that has 400 skies. This has uh, blue skies, it has sunrise, it has sunset. It actually even has some Milky Way and night sky skies in it and also some storm skies too and let's see here if i just go ahead we'll just see what is going to make a really nice one um let me scroll down here and look for that might be in folder number two let me just take a quick look and okay here we are this is the one i was looking for Let's take a look at this one here and see what kind of fun we can have. Right off the bat, this looks pretty cool. Uh, let's go ahead and adjust this horizon position though. Bring this down and throw in some lightning in here. And look at how believable this came. I mean, it, it, my foreground, the color, it relighted the scene a little bit to match what's going on in the sky. Um, I can further do that, maybe darken this a little bit. And all of a sudden I have a completely different image than what was a nice sunrise image beforehand. So this looks pretty cool just with a couple different clicks of the, uh, of the sliders. Let's even try one other thing here. Let's go ahead and load a custom sky. Let's try one of these uh, Milky Way photos. Let's go ahead and check that out. And let's adjust the horizon position on that. And now look at that relight scene has relit it again. Nice and dark foreground here. You know, this is stuff that uh, I teach some night sky workshops too. And this is something that looks totally believable if you have just a little bit of a moon behind you. And what we do is you end up doing a couple exposures. You do a long, long exposure for your foreground to get all the detail in your foreground. And then you do another exposure for your sky to get a really, really nice sky. And then in various programs and post-processing, you then put all those two together. You could actually even do that inside of Luminar 4. Um, I just happened to be taking a photo that was photographed in the early morning hours and put a Milky Way photo above it. And that looks pretty believable. I could go into uh, maybe further enhance it with a little bit of AI accent, um, maybe give it just a little bit more uh, contrast. And there we go. Now we have three different versions from this original file. So once you start playing around with, uh, with sky replacement, it's amazing some of the things that you can do differently just with that one image. Okay, I'm gonna grab another sip of water here, Mark. Do we have any questions from that? Yes, sir. Uh, let's see here. Tom says, uh, he asked, does sky replacement work after a lookup table or look has been applied? I would probably wait to do your sky replacement and then do the the, uh, the lookup table afterwards. Uh, but let's go ahead here. I've never done that before. Let's go ahead and check that out though. We can test that really fast. So let me go ahead and uh, let's reset that. And let's go down to, uh, oh boy, it's been a while since I've used the lookup tables. Let me, probably in the pro section here. Ah, where are my lookup tables? Oh, right, there we, we are. are. Yeah. All right, let's just choose um, something that will be obvious.
All right, well, that's kind of really punchy and everything. So that's pretty obvious there. Now, if you did do a, at this point here, if you did a stamp layer, it's gonna obviously then bake in that lookup table color. And then when you replace your sky, your sky is gonna be, you know, whatever your original sky is. So this is another reason why if you're using a lookup table, you're probably gonna wanna do it all, um, you know, at the very end stage. Um, re, you know, do all your color corrections, do your sky replacement, and then add the lookup table. And another reason why is because if I did do, um, let's see, not in that, if I did do, remember how I was talking about earlier when I was using the AI accent filter and stuff like that, you know, that's gonna be adjusting any sky that I put in right now. So I bet you if I did put the sky in, this uh, lookup table would probably, yeah, it is being applied to that, but so is that AI um, enhance the accent. So that's being applied to the sky too. So um, while it can be done, I would really recommend doing everything but that lookup table, replace your sky, then make a new stamp layer. And then when you apply that lookup table, it's gonna apply it evenly to the whole image. Any other questions? Okay, Tom, did that uh, answer your question, sir? Uh, Linda says, do you do you do test prints? Do you find you need to go back and fine tune if you do a test print? Oh yeah, I mean, I do that with all my photographs. So, you know, whether, you know, it doesn't even matter if I'm doing sky replacement at all or anything like that. Uh, yeah, you know, printing is definitely, I mean, first off, um, excuse me, first off, I'm using a color calibrated monitor. And so I, you know, I, I'm pretty familiar with how my screen looks relative to the print. And I have a color managed workflow from my photo editing all the way through to my printing and, uh, you know, including the profiles that I'm using for my paper. And so I'm, I'm pretty good now at, I know when I have something on my screen, usually what I have to do is just make a slight adjustment in the midtones just to bring up, a, brighten it up just a little bit. And then I have a really good print, but I will do some test prints and, um, you know, I have it dialed in pretty good, but I will still do some test prints before I'm then printing that final, you know, wall piece photo. Okay. Uh, Anita asked, do you do edits with Topaz Denoise? I do. Yeah. I and mean, I use a lot of different programs. Um, I don't use Denoise that often just because I don't photograph a whole lot of noisy images. Um, but when I do the uh, Topaz Denoise works really well. Um, it is sort of, it does some AI and sometimes I've noticed that the AI, again, doesn't always pick up where you want it to pick up and it's making its own decisions. So sometimes I have to override it and paint in certain things or paint out certain things. But uh, Topaz Denoise is a really good program. Uh, so is their AI sharpener as well. I highly recommend them. And especially if there's any Olympus photographers out there who shoot in the high res modes of Olympus, the Sharpen AI is amazing on the stabilized mode. Matt, have you ever used AI Clear? A uh, little bit. That's uh, one of their others. Yeah, so that will help. Um, it's kind of a combination. The contrast and the the sharp. Yeah, and it. I. I yeah. love. It. I love it, especially on wildlife stuff. That's right. Yeah, you were telling me about that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it works really well. Uh, on this particular mm -hmm. photo, Jackie asked, "Was this taken with your Olympus, and if so, which body and lens?" This one wasn't, this was one of my older ones. This was with a uh, Sony. Okay. Um, I left Sony full frame for Olympus uh, a little over a year ago and uh, super happy, never looking back. The uh, cottage image was uh, was shot with my Olympus. Actually, that was for a commercial shoot that I was doing out in Missouri. Uh, but in terms of Olympus cameras, I have the uh, OMD EM1 Mark II and Mark III and the EM1X. Okay. and a whole lot of lenses. Chuck, you said thanks. She says she has the EM-IX. Oh, uh, the EM-1X, yep. Yeah, it's M1X. a great okay, camera. So. Yep. Yeah, that, that camera in particular was what uh, pulled me into Olympus. Uh, Olympus gave me a free trial of a couple of their, uh, uh, of that body and a couple of their lenses last year. And uh, boy, they sent that to me and I didn't, I didn't use my Sony after since, uh, yeah. And that's it, Matt, so far. Okay, cool. Let's go ahead and I'm gonna show you a, there's another feature that I haven't talked about yet, and that is the uh, augmented sky. And let's go ahead over here 
and we are looking at the after photo. And let me go ahead and show you the before. Is it going to show it? Still processing. There we are. Okay, so the before photo and the after. Come on, get off there. There we are. Before and after. Sometimes you have a nice sky, but you you just need some clouds in a certain area. And this image is great, except for this whole dead space area that I had to just put some clouds in. And that is what I'm using the AI uh, augmented sky for. So let's take a look at that here. And I also have uh, in my blue sky clouds kit, I have 60 photos that are specific for this, um, this tool inside of Luminar. And they are different than regular clouds. These are all black and white. And the reason why they're black and white is because behind the scenes, the sky, the uh, augmented sky is knocking out all that black in the image and then just giving you the clouds. So I use that on this image and let's go ahead and open up the advanced settings. And let's see, I use number 55. Let me go ahead and we'll reset this and I'll go from scratch here and show you how that works. So we'll go ahead and load custom image and I'll navigate to where I had that. And that was number 55 over here. And I'll just show you what that whole thing looked like there. So really nice clouds. I selected this because they kind of match the clouds that were already in my photo. So go ahead and click on open. And now this is where the augmented sky has some technology that the sky replacement doesn't have. And I hope they get the sky replacement, uh, some of this technology sometime soon. This place object, if I click on that, I can now move my clouds anywhere I want to in the sky. I can even increase or decrease the, the size of the clouds. So I'm hoping that the AI sky replacement gets some of this technology in here because that would make um, you know some of the issues of you know just being able to really put this the sky the clouds exactly where you want that'll help that tremendously so just by shrinking this down a little bit and look at how perfectly that matches my other clouds uh if i click on that place object again now it's locked in there and i mean look at this taking a look at before and after much better image it fills in that dead space completely i can warm or cool down the clouds if i need to Again, you have that relight scene, uh, same, works the same way in the AI sky replacement. And then there's some advanced settings, mask refinement and defocus. Mask refinement, if you're noticing some issues around the edges, you'd use the mask refinement to try and help that. Um, sometimes I've noticed I've had to use that if I'm putting in some of these clouds behind an object like, um, like tree branches or something. And then the defocus. Let me show you a good example of defocus. Let's go ahead and go back to my library here and let's take a look at this sunflower here. I replaced the sky and used the defocus on this one here. And let's take a look at that once that fully finishes loading. Okay, so here's without the sky replacement or actually the augmented sky. So I liked the blue of the sky but it just needed some clouds. I mean, this is kind of a cool photo, but again, I was thinking that with some clouds, you know, it'll just kick it up a little bit. And so I added uh, this cloud in particular, hit the place object, moved it around to exactly where I thought would make a nice composition. And then I increased the defocus to 83. And why did I do that? Well, let's take a look if I zero out that defocus. Okay, you can tell that this photo of the sunflower was either photographed with a, uh, with a big telephoto lens or a macro lens. Uh, this was actually with my um, with my Olympus camera, and I forget, does it tell me? Uh, okay, so my 40 to 150 with a teleconverter. So I was kind of zoomed in uh, pretty good on this. So this is a telephoto shot, and it was shot at uh, f7.1. So on a telephoto lens, even at 7.1, you're not gonna have a lot of depth of field to begin with. So to me, this photo just doesn't look natural because you would not expect to take this photo. And if these were real clouds, you would not expect to have that much detail in the clouds. So by increasing the defocus to an amount that looks appropriate, that then helps you. It helps sell the believability of this photo because now the sky, the clouds are, are knocked down. They're out of focus. And, and it also still draws all the attention to the sunflower 
and you know with that nice blue in the background there i didn't need to replace the sky i could have uh, but I thought just adding some clouds and keeping that original blue in really helped seal the deal on this image. Now, there's some other things that you can do with this uh, AI. Let me just go ahead and grab this photo here. Uh, same image, just without anything. Actually, a slightly different image. Bees in a different place. The AI augmented sky, it's kind of funny because I think they um, kind of... Uh, oh, boy, that looks terrible. Let me um, at least make this look a little bit better color-wise bump up some of the AI accent. Um, but anyways, the uh, AI augmented sky, if you look at what they give you here, they give you a whole bunch of things. I mean, so you can add some birds to your image and let's see where those birds come up. Uh, they're way down here. Uh, so that comes stock with, uh, with the program. Uh, they have some clouds, but they have a hot air balloon, uh, an Aurora, an Eagle. Uh, let's just at least take a look at the balloon while we're here. So this is kind of like what they were thinking of in terms of this whole um, AI augmented sky. Of course, if this was actually in there, I'd want to defocus that balloon. So you can add a whole bunch of different objects. Um, I thought it worked really cool just from the demonstrations that I've shown you just in specific with the clouds. But uh, you know, if you have any other cutouts of images, there's a certain way these files have to be formatted. Um, I'm actually considering releasing a new kit with some of these fun things in it. I got to go out and think about, you know, what would be fun objects to put in the background. Um, you know, even a moon, I and mean, that'd be pretty cool being able to put a moon somewhere in the background there. Maybe increase that a little bit. You can even rotate it a little and throw that up there. So that's what they were thinking of with this augmented sky uh, AI. But I think it's just great. We're just on the images that you just need to add a cloud or two. Uh, go ahead and use that on, on your images. All right, Mark, what do we got for questions on that? Sir, we have nothing. You wow, that either means I'm doing such a great job explaining <laughs> this yeah, there you that go. they right. don't have any questions or I've already bored them to death and they're asleep. And <laughs> I'll just go through and show you just a couple other pictures that I had done some sky replacements on um, and show you some before and afters. Uh, Tom said he's so, downloaded. Uh, oh, no, it's too late. That, 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 Tom, that's too late. You, no, you didn't have a question already. I'm not answering this. <laughs> he said he downloaded some moon images from NASA and they work well. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And that's all um, because that's our taxpayer dollars at work there. Um, that's all uh, royalty free images, too. So you can go ahead and do whatever you want with that. So, yeah, good suggestion. That, good suggestion there. Yep. Uh, th this image here. This was just a I mean, look at it. boring. I mean, it was nice. I mean, I liked I liked the uh, color of this uh, desert flower here, but um, you know, again, that boring blue sky in the background, throwing in a desert sunset sky, adding some defocus to the background, makes this a, a, lot, a heck of a lot nicer photo, I think. And let's go ahead here and take a look. Here's a. Uh, this was photographed in my backyard up here in Montana. And just looking at the back, uh, original, oh, let's wait for it to fully load here. Hold down one second. So come on, stay there. So I had some really nice backlighting to this. This was uh, just near sunset, some really good backlighting to it. But again, just that blue sky. So adding a little bit of color to that sky, defocus in it um, with that cloud texture really makes this a really nice image now. And here, just a bird from the backyard. Wait for this guy to load. And look at the before. Come on. Here's my before. Again, that boring blue sky and the background. And on this one here, I did do a full sky replacement. We can see this was the image after I did some enhancement using the AI accent and brightening it up a little bit, warming up the bird a little bit and the whole the whole scene, and then throwing in a sky here. And I flipped the sky because this sky came in initially like this, but I didn't like the way the clouds were following this line of the branch in the background. So I flipped the sky horizontally, went nice across here, breaking this line, 
And uh, you know, now this is a really cool image. Again, with that sky to focus maxed out, this is not going to look believable at all. So I mean, now I mean, you know, I'm sure everyone can agree. You you post this online, people are going to be like, oh, you totally replaced that sky. So throw that sky out of focus. And I don't think anyone could look at this image and be like, hmm, what's going on here? Uh, there are some other things um, that you can do, you know, in terms of if you're going to be doing sky replacements with water, it gets a little tricky in uh, in Luminar 4 because Luminar 4 is relying on AI to do its masking, especially in the sky. Uh, but when you're dealing with the foreground, you know, when you're dealing with um, reflections, there's a lot more to it. So it, while it can be done, it's not the most elegant thing in the world. Um, I'll just go through this really fast. Um, if you are ever going to be doing sky replacement and replacing the sky and also adding it to your foreground, what I recommend doing first, now this was this sky wasn't replaced, but I recommend first is studying how reflections play relative to your sky because it really depends on, and perspective is so important when you're trying to do this type of thing to make it believable. This photo here of the Tetons, we can see here, if I zoom in a little bit, um, I'm looking for where the clouds are hitting the peaks. And so I can see a little bit of a break here. And down over here, I see that break repeated. And this is all because of my perspective to the Tetons right now. But in other instances, uh, let me see here, where's this photo in Zion? You know, if that whole thing held true, if I had a cloud right up here above this uh, canyon wall in Zion, you know, look at, the way that I'm crouched down in this image, I'm exaggerating my foreground. So now this whole reflection goes all the way to the beginning. So you're not even seeing the blue sky above that uh, canyon wall in the background. So that's one tricky thing about doing a uh, really convincing sky replacement that also has a reflection. And the only way to get better at it is to really just, when you're out there photographing, Look at how perspectives change if you're along the water, water's edge. You know, you're standing up and then crouch down, you know, get down onto the ground level and see how the perspective changes anything, any positioning of the sky in your photo. And look through some of your older photos too to see what's happening in your reflections. Uh, that's part one of getting a good, believable um, sky replacement with a water reflection. The other thing is too, is that now I've already gone ahead here, uh, let me wait for this to process, but I've already gone ahead and replaced the sky in this. So we can see, uh, hold on one second, wait for it to fully finish. Okay, so this is my before and after. So I added a sky up on top here, and this was uh, number 143. So to do that reflection in the bottom, what you have to do is I'm gonna go ahead and click on my layers, click on the plus and click on add a new image layer. And I forgot which number sky that was, uh, 143. And let's see here. Okay, here it is right here, 143. So this is adding a new image layer. I'm gonna click and open that and it's gonna completely erase. You won't see my the Tetons anymore. It's gonna completely fill it in. I'm gonna lower the opacity a little bit and I'm just giving you a real quick demo demo on how you know you would do a sky replacement with a water reflection. So lower your opacity a little bit so that you can see behind, see that layer behind you, see where the tetons are, and then click on layer transform. And then the very first thing you need to do is flip this vertically. So this little icon right here will flip it vertically, and then you need to position it. And I'm going to bring this all the way down here for a second, and we just saw in my previous example that actually had real clouds, the peaks of the Tetons relative to the clouds were matching up here in my foreground. So what I need to do is find out where those clouds were upside down and match that to where the water is. And so it looks like uh, it's right in this general area here. If I look at these peaks right along the top, those are matching up pretty close to that. Once I do that, click on done. This will now apply the transformation and it'll bring me back into an editing mode in a second here. There we are. Okay, from here what you have to do is do some masking first 
And this is where sky replacement gets really difficult inside of Luminar 4 because it, it has no edge aware, edge content aware brushes at all. All you're able to do is increase or decrease the size of your brush and also increase or decrease the feathering on your brush. So I'm gonna go ahead and erase, um, actually it might even just be easier to paint in the effect here. Let's go ahead and try that. Let's paint in the clouds to the water. So if I start clicking and going like this, it's painting in my sky. So it's probably the easiest way to do this one. And let me shrink my brush size down. This is where it gets tricky because then you have over here, you have all these branches and wait for the screen to refresh. Come on, there we are. Oh, just had it. This is another little bit of a quirk inside of uh, Luminar. Okay, so now what you have to do is keep on zooming in, shrinking your brush size down so you can get right up in close to all these little branches and fill in all those gaps. Um, honestly, with this particular image, with all this stuff in my foreground, unless I wanted to be sitting at the computer for hours, I wouldn't even try doing a sky replacement on <laughs> this photo, just, just to be honest here. But once you do have that all done and you have a nice, um, you know, a nice cutout here, so to speak, of your reflection. Uh, go ahead and click on done on your mask. And then it's a matter of adjusting the blending mode. Usually you'll probably end up using the lighten mode. If I click on lighten, it softens up the look a little bit, but then I'm also gonna lower the opacity of it as well. If we remember on the image that I showed you with the real clouds and the real reflection, the water here was a little bit darker than, than the sky. So if I lower that opacity a little bit more, that kind of helps darken that in a little bit. And lighten is usually my go-to, but it doesn't hurt to take a look at screen or overlay a couple of these other blending modes. I mean, actually hard light doesn't look too terrible right there right now. So go ahead and play with a couple of those blending modes to then make that believable. So that's pretty much it with the uh, water reflections. Uh, it is a little bit tricky. It's a, it's a more advanced technique. And it's something that, I mean, I might even just end up doing that, maybe do my sky replacement in Luminar and maybe, you know, on one or Topaz mask AI, see if I can get a better mask and, and do the, um, do the uh, flip, flip the sky into that and put it in there for the, for the reflection. All right, Mark. All right, thanks, Matt. Yeah, uh, Mark Barthel had a question about reflections. You already answered it. I think the general oh, rule of thumb, people, and you've already mentioned it, is that your reflection is generally a little darker than your mm -hmm. than your uh, reflected image. So um, to make it yep. believable. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Tom asks, uh, is Luminar 4 your primary post-processing software? No, it's not. It's my, um, it is actually my primary um, enhancement software. So I use, um, I use Capture One Pro is my main raw processing software. Um, I haven't been able to use it lately because they haven't updated it yet for the new Olympus Mark III. So I've been using Lightroom, uh, which isn't bad. Um, Capture One Pro for me is the best in terms of noise control, shadow and highlight recovery. But then what I do is whether I'm using Capture One Pro or uh, Lightroom, and I've been using Lightroom actually a lot more too, just because I've been doing some editing on my iPad and uh, sending things over via the cloud. So that's kind of fun. But uh, anyways, I'll get a nice photo from my raw processor, Lightroom or Capture One Pro. And then I will use Luminar 4, uh, usually as a plugin inside of Photoshop at this point to do some fine tune enhancements to the image just to give it a little bit more pop to it. So I use it as a as a finishing tool, and I use it quite often in that regard. All righty. Anybody else have any last minute questions? Uh, Matt, uh, good job. Yeah, yeah. Fire away on the last minute questions, and yeah. I'll just load up. And after you guys are... uh, I have sent Matt an invitation to our Facebook group, uh, like I did uh, Hazel, who's presented for us. So Matt will now be a, a professional member of our Facebook group. So he'll be available if you have any questions about uh, this particular webinar or anything else. Matt will be. Um, he should have that invite in his um, Facebook box inbox. And um, so Matt just lives down there, down the street from me, actually. So.
Mm -hmm. uh, let's see here. Uh, Tom said, great webinar, Matt. And oh, thank uh, you. Linda Thanks, said, Tom. I learned a lot. John said, oh, thanks, thanks, Linda. It was great. Diane said, it was thanks, very interesting. John. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, we got a lot of new members here recently. So um, Mark said, terrific. Thanks, Matt. Sarah said, thanks. Emil said, thanks. Bill said, thanks. Uh, Jeff Coyle said, good stuff, Matt. Thanks, Barb Santel. Let's see. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, uh, Dennis, Debbie, Mike. So, yeah. Good job, Matt. Great. Appreciate it. And, uh, awesome. Thanks. And I'll, um, as always, I will get this up on YouTube, and I'll post it on our Facebook page, and I'll uh, put the link as part of the um, post so you guys can have, uh, if you didn't, for those who didn't attend, they can actually have a live link. So, perfect. All yeah, right. and I tried, uh, we tried setting up the video camera so you could see me on this too, but GoToWebinar was not uh, cooperating. So, if you guys want to see me live in action, uh, check out later this week on Olympus's Instagram. Uh, they, I am doing a story takeover on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and you'll see some video of me doing some cool stuff. On Olympus gear, and even if you're not an Olympus shooter, it's uh, some pretty cool creative stuff that uh, that can happen with today's technology with cameras. Corey says the sky to focus is especially good to hear. Yeah, that's a, a fairly recent um, new feature, and I and I just think Luminar will get better, you know, mm -hmm. as as they uh, as they go along. Yeah. So, and um, and Jackie says uh, I love Olympus. Uh, thanks for doing that. So, yeah. <laughs> Well, cool. otherwise, I think that's it, Matt. So appreciate it very much, right. my friend. Hey, and, thank you. Um, thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for attending. You bet.